Thank you. Um, and moving right along, I, I will introduce Shelly Evans, our um, program coordinator. Good evening, everybody. I'm um, very pleased to introduce Jen Vanderhoof. Jen has worked in the science section at King County for over 22 years. And during that time, her work is often focused on issues related to wildlife and biodiversity. Jen appreciates the intersection of policy and science and the practical application of science. In her work, she brings those interests to bear as lead of King County's Beaver Working Group, which is focused on the coexistence of people and beavers for the benefits of ecosystem health, salmon recovery, and climate change adaptation. Outside of work, she's a master birder, a longtime local diver, a wildlife and underwater photographer, and current president of Beavers Northwest. Please join me in giving Jen a warm welcome. Thanks, Shelley. I appreciate that. And, and thank you for inviting me. And thanks everybody for coming tonight. This is this is exciting. So let's let's get going. Um, as the title suggests, tonight I'm going to talk about a little bit about beaver life history for some background information. Then I'll dig into plant preferences and uh, finish up with imagining or reimagining the past. So I'll start with some pretty basic stuff about beavers. As most of you probably know, they are rodents. They're also herbivores. Not everybody knows that. Some people think they eat fish, they don't. They are vegetarians. And they have exceptionally sharp teeth and strong muscles for cutting, but are pretty docile. So unless you harass one, you're, they're not going to come after you, generally speaking. Um, this one apparently likes to mug for the camera as well. Beavers mate for life. And in the wild, they can live you know, 12 years, give or take, unless something happens. They can actually live quite a bit longer than that um, in captivity. But in the wild, they, they mate for life. And if one happens to die, then the, the, the remaining beaver will find another mate and, and continue on. And so what you'll have is um, within a given colony, you'll have a mated pair. So basically a matriarch and a patriarch, and then the young of the previous two years. And if you, if you, if you caught what I just said, I, I use the word colony, which is actually not accurate, technically accurate. It's not a colony, it's a family and a family group. And here around Puget Sound, the, the um, female usually gives birth around April or May, give or take. And so right about that same time, the, the two-year-olds, so the, the oldest youngsters that are living in the family, they have, to, they have to leave. They have to go find a place of their own. And so um, every rule, of course, is, is meant to be broken. So these are general generalities. It's kind of the general family structure you can think about. But sometimes the two-year-olds don't want to leave and maybe stay for another year. Um, and, and then family size can also vary quite a bit. You can get really small families. Maybe they'll, the adults will only have one kit in a year or even maybe skip a year if the habitat is really horrible. But if there's plenty of food and they're doing great, they can have, they can have a lot. I think think in terms of two to four is probably roughly normal, but I think that um, I have evidence of, of a female that um, had 12 or 13. So they, they can actually have quite a few when times are really good. The beaver family lives in a lodge and any given family, they can actually have more than one lodge, but um, not to complicate things, we'll just stick to one. And I think this is a, a beautiful, little work of art here. Um, this form that you see is called a hut lodge. It's like an island. So the hut lodges are built in open uh, bodies of water, shallower bodies of water, because they extend all the way to the, to the, um, to the bottom. So they'd be like an island, they, they don't float. And if you do have a bigger family, an older lodge that's been around and they've been successful for a really long time, they can be they can be huge. Um, this one, some of you may have seen if you've driven uh, east on 520. 
It's actually over 50 feet wide. It's a monster. It's it's a big one. I don't know how long it's been there. I don't. I would love to figure that out. Um, another form of lodge is called a bank lodge, and this is actually a shabby little thing. I I'm not. This is not the best example, but you can still get the idea that in a place where there's already kind of a large pond or maybe lake or a river, rather than trying to build a hut in, the, in a place that would just be too deep, um, they will excavate mud out of the bank and they often will do that at the base of a tree. And so what they're doing is taking advantage of the root structure to, to just provide more support for the thing. And then they'll still top it with wood like you would on, on a hut lodge. Here's a picture of a, of a healthier one. It's bigger. This one definitely looks active. I'm not entirely sure if the previous one was, was active when I took that picture. But the, the thing that is kind of interesting and different about this one is it's behind the tree and it's huge. So this, this can also give you an idea of the variability that you'll see and why I've learned to never generalize when it, or try not to generalize when it comes to beavers. But anytime I generalize, you always say there's multiple other options and everything is, is unique. Um, just, you could almost throw a rock and hit this other bank lodge, quote unquote bank lodge. I suspect this started out as more of a normal bank lodge and they just kept building and building and building because it looks like a hut lodge that's jammed up against a bank. And the beauty of, of beaver lodges and, and the thing that is so cool is they build them so that the entrance to the lodge is underwater. And by doing that, it makes it pretty impossible for any predator to follow them into their home. Um, there is a real good reason that one of the only two places in the United States that don't have beavers are places in Florida that do have alligators for obvious reasons, right? So I already said in places where um, that are deeper, they can just, you know, do their thing. They don't, they don't need to worry about, um, no, they don't need to worry about building a dam. So the reason that you build a dam is to have water covering the entrance to the lodge. Um, just like lodges, dams come in many shapes and sizes and are actually constructed of different materials. But generally speaking, um, they're, they're built of wood and the wood is always on the downstream facing side and then they use mud, they pack mud up against the upstream side to, to seal it. So this photo, this is actually a screen capture of a video. And I was surprised at how quickly they work. Um, it doesn't look real technical. The beaver just swam up, slapped some mud against the side and it whipped around and took off again. But do that over and over and you've got a, a water sealed dam. And I think, I don't know if you can see that, but sometimes they get a little muddy in the process. And like I said, all dams vary. Um, this is pretty different. This one is actually built in an agricultural ditch. So I imagine upstream of here, there's, there's a bank dam. Um, I'm sorry, a bank lodge. This is not prime habitat. However, it was right next to a cornfield. They unfortunately ended up killing a lot of corn, but my, I'm guessing they probably built it there, hoping to take advantage and maybe actually eat some of the corn. So speaking of eating corn, what's for dinner? Um, now I'll transition to, to the plants that they eat. And, and this is a favorite. They love, I, there's part of me that like doesn't want to say, since you all know your plants, but um, that would be silly. So they love aspen, so do I, but we don't have much aspen in Puget Sound, as you know. Um, the, the next best thing that we have very regularly is cottonwood, which doesn't always look like this, but anybody who's done a restoration project that installed cottonwood stakes has maybe experienced the pain that, that some might feel when looking at this photo. I don't, but some people might. So beavers love cottonwood and they also, their favorite size range of, of um, woody vegetation to eat is actually in the like one to two, one to three inch range. So it turns out that a cottonwood steak or a willow steak of the same size, it's, it's, it's really beaver candy. It's so tasty and um, you can't blame them, right? 
This one, this photo might look a little bit more normal. So they will cut down trees. This is not a huge tree, but you can tell from the picture that the base is bigger than two or three inches. When they drop a tree like this, then they go for the branches, which is again in that nice size range. And you can probably guess that this tree hadn't been down very long at all. I don't know if they just cut it the day before, but pretty recently. And they immediately went for the low hanging fruit. Bad joke. Um, the low hanging branches, the ones that are easy to get. Because who doesn't love some really good cottonwood? So this, this picture, I love this picture because you can tell exactly what happened. It tells a story, uh, but it's also not surprising because you know beavers could easily be that tall, but I, I wanted to insert a little mystery here. And I find more, the more that I learn about beavers, the more mysteries that I find. This is definitely higher, taller than normal beaver height. Those are cuts. So that's me in the one picture on the left, and that is um, a good five feet off the ground. It's about four inch diameter branch from a, a western red cedar. And then on the right, I actually don't remember what that tree is, but that's those are more than five feet tall. And I can tell you that I tested those, and they are they're sturdy. They they don't bend. And these are also two places that don't flood and don't get a lot of snow. So I have absolutely no idea how this is happening. And I've seen it in other places too. So back to the slightly more expected, um, but equally cool food facts. Another favorite that everybody could probably guess are willows. So this picture was taken about a year ago. It was actually taken at Montlakeville. And I was out there birding and saw this and almost every single one of these willow shrubs had been chewed pretty heavily by beavers. And I think it's super cool. And I'm just going from one to the next one. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. But I'm also worried about other people seeing that and, and worrying and wanting to do something about the beavers so that they don't do that. So I was kind of trying to figure out if I should approach anybody to talk about it, but time went on and I didn't. And then um, I was out there over the summer and I didn't take a picture but I couldn't even tell if I was in the right place. It was so thoroughly overgrown, you couldn't even tell. And this photo is from just a week or two ago in the same area. So unfortunately, leaf off doesn't really give the, the full effect, but you, you can get the idea that the stuff grows back, the willows and the cottonwoods. And here's another uh, shot of a willow. This is from Magnuson Park. And I don't think it's an accident of nature that the species that beavers prefer the most are also the ones that excel at re-sprouting. I don't think that's an accident. So over the time, you know, over time, the same shrub can be cut over and over and over. The ones in this photo looks like they've probably been cut on two different occasions. One pretty recently in the photo, and then the other one looks like it had been a while back. Uh, you can kind of see on the, the left side there, the older cut. And here's one that I think has probably been cut three times. There's a lot going on in this picture, but the original cut is underneath all the moss. And then the second round of cuts are the darker ones. And then you can see the really fresh one on the right there. And so the, not only do I think it's interesting that their preferred species are the ones that do quite well re-sprouting and vegetatively reproducing. But another thing that I think about is how they affect the form, the, the structure of the plant itself. Um, and my apologies, these are not natives, but these are uh, two, I believe they used to be weeping willows. They were two trees at a place where the, the, the gentleman who owns the land um, would host weddings and, and the co wedding couple would stand in front of the trees and get their pictures taken. And then this happened. Beavers came in and cut his trees down. And he's a very nice gentleman, but he wasn't very happy about that at all. And I don't blame him. Uh, the good news is, I will say that one of the easiest and best 
tools for coexisting with beavers is fence. And so if you do have any particular trees or vegetation that you're very, very fond of and you really don't ever want to see it cut down by a beaver because it's you know near water, um, you can wrap it with fence. It's very, very effective, incredibly effective. Um, but anyway, so if you if you can just kind of wrap your mind a little bit around the fact that this is an animal that can potentially at a very large scale change the the vegetation community structure. So not just they're not just cutting down a tree and then another tree grows up. They're actually changing the shape of what is growing out there. Okay. So what else do they like to eat besides cottonwoods and willows? So I and I do I put cottonwoods and willows in kind of a the top tier, they're the favorites for sure, but they're not always around. And so what else do beavers kind of like? Maybe that they don't like them the most, but they don't like them the least. And I think I would probably put Western red cedar in that category. Um, this is this is a huge tree. It's, this is out at um, uh, Mount Rainier National Park. And it's, I don't know, maybe two feet, give or take, you could sit on there and it would look like you were sitting in a chair. Um, I think that this rodent was very patient and took on a very large project. I would never be that patient, but um, they, as you saw the, the picture with me pointing at the four inch one, they, they like all sizes from what I can tell. This, here's another mystery. I'm gonna show you another mystery. So this is a, a tiny little Western red cedar seedling that was at a restoration site down along the White River. And um, some of my colleagues planted a whole bunch of these. And then here's the thing that perplexes me. Something came along, presumably beavers, I'm assuming by the shape of the cut and just clipped them, a whole bunch of them, not just one or two, and they didn't eat any of the any of the vegetation they just cut them all in half and so a bunch of us were kind of speculating maybe they're farming maybe they they know that they don't like them and they just want to get rid of them so that something that they like more might grow up in their place and i i like to think about that it's fun and it's really interesting but um they some of them do like red cedars and so if if that is what was going on here, not only is it interesting, but it, it certainly points to individual preferences as well. Uh, and here's one more picture of, of uh, another screenshot of uh, a beaver. And at this point in time, I don't think it had a lot of other food choices in the area. So again, it's like the second tier. If there'd been a bunch of willows here um, and cottonwood, we might see something else coming down that, that dam. That's the, that's the um, downstream face of a dam right there. Another um, uh, plant that I would put in that sort of second tier uh, is salmonberry. They, they will eat it when it's around, um, despite the thorns and stuff that doesn't seem to bother them. And another plant that I'll put in that same category is vine maple. So in the third tier, I, I would put these next couple of species in a group that I would probably call, if you know, desperate times come for des call for desperate measures. They're not their favorite, but if nothing else is around and they don't want to leave for whatever reason, then they'll go to the red alder. And so I think that's what's happening here. This is a place where all the cottonwood is long since gone. And there was only a, a little tiny bit of willows left. And I don't even know why that surprises me unless they're intentionally leaving it. Like when you have the last candy you know, cookie in the box and you maybe don't wanna eat it yet or something, I'm not sure. But um, the other plant that I would put in this same category is Douglas fir. And here's a series of different pictures and I, I'm still, I'm, I'm puzzled by what they do with Douglas fir. So this is kind of an ongoing story and I just keep watching to see what happens. They don't really seem to like them, but here's some evidence that they'll take them. And if you notice the, the second and fourth picture, they look 
a little smaller, a little younger, and those are the ones that have been utilized the most. And so I don't know if age has something to do with it. I don't, and somebody else pointed out that a lot of the conifers, and because they, they, they aren't big conifer fans, a lot of the conifers have a lot of sap. And, um, and so maybe that's why they like Western red cedar because it doesn't have so much sap. But here you see sap, I'm not an expert and I'm sure somebody could, or probably a lot of people could write in the, uh, in the chat if there are different times a year where there's more sap. And so maybe they, they go for Douglas fir during times of year when there's less sap. Maybe the younger ones have less sap. So I don't know, these are, these are things that um, I think about and if other people have the answer to, I'm, I'm happy to, I'm happy to learn more. Um, this to me is like a wasteland. This is a sad, sad photo. It, it looks like they, I'm not, I mean, I don't even know. I, people could put different captions on this picture, but it kind of looks like they just really don't like Douglas fir and they want to get rid of them. Um, I, I'm not going to ascribe that was the motivation here. I have a feeling they just kind of tried it and didn't like it, but it's, it's kind of sad. <laughs> Um, one of the questions that I actually get asked probably most often when it comes to beavers and vegetation is what don't they like? What can we plant that they won't eat? And there aren't very many things that I can tell you because in, in, if a beaver is desperate enough, it's probably going to eat just about anything vegetation wise. But from my observations, and this is not a picture of nine bark, but um, they seem to avoid Pacific nine bark. So far, of all the plants that I've watched, that's the one that I haven't seen any beaver chew from. Other people also say that they will um, avoid red osier dogwood. I think that's what this is. And clearly this beaver is not avoiding them. So, so they avoid them until they don't avoid them, I guess. I have no idea where a Western crab apple falls out on the preference scale, but I included this photo because I think it is just beautiful. Um, that's what this used to be, I'm pretty sure, because there was another one growing right next to it that didn't get cut down. Um, I just think that looks like a work of art. This is a very recent photo. I took this just yesterday, and this is another little mystery. I have never seen this before, but it looks like they're stacking vegetation, like food, on top of their lodge. So usually by the time they're putting sticks and stuff and, and working on their lodge, they've already eaten. So, you know, they cut something down, they eat all the bark off, and then they'll take the rest of the wood and use it to, for their dam or for their lodge. This almost looks like, you know, you go shopping and, and maybe get an extra box of ding dongs or something and stash it away for later. So I'm super curious what's going on here. Um, I will mention one more shrub. It's not a native, but it's something that they actually eat, which surprised me at first. Again, uh, it, this is Himalayan blackberry. Uh, the, the thorns don't seem to bother them. I got several pictures of them eating and cutting and towing, presumably towing back to the lodge to share with the kits even. So, uh, you know, they're mammals. You think they have soft tissue. So I don't know why the, in their mouths, I don't know why the thorns don't bother them but they, they don't seem to. So a little recap, um, preferred willows and black cottonwoods. Then we get into the red cedars, pine maple, salmonberry, and then the red alder and Douglas fir. And the ones in the middle, I just, I don't know. Um, and I wouldn't have even had evergreen huckleberry on here had it not been for yesterday. And obviously this is not a comprehensive list. But the ones on the right are, are pretty well known to be least preferred. Um, the true firs, Sitka spruce, and then the nine bark. And cascara, I've seen reports going in both directions. And then the other ones are, I mean, those are small little shrubs. So they're not, the, as people don't pay as much attention just because so much of what we plant these days is, seems to be geared towards creating shade um, in salmon recovery projects. So I, I just don't know that much about those. And beavers don't just eat trees and shrubs. They actually will eat 
quite a bit of herbaceous materials. I don't know what this is, but I would be happy if somebody told me what they're eating here. Um, this is this is the photo that was used to promote this talk, and I I feel bad because it's that's not a native and you're the Native Plant Society, so I I do apologize for picking a poor choice of a plant, but they they seem to love eating these, and I this is um, just an observation. It, you know, from, a, from going out a couple of times, so I could be completely wrong, but they seem to like the non-native lilies more than the natives, at least in this area. But who knows, maybe this summer when I'm out watching, I'll see the exact opposite. So um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, write that down as, as gospel, but it's, you know, it's interesting that they are removing some of the non-natives. Unfortunately, they're not removing them enough to get rid of them, which would be nice. Um, so in addition to lilies, they also eat cattails. And I, I'm actually not quite sure what's going on in this picture because that's a whole bunch of cattail clippings. And what I also found is they, they seem to really enjoy the, the rhizomes. This is leftover, but I, I had found a fair amount of evidence they'd been eating rhizomes. The, all the little roots that are going off to the side, we found piles and piles of those as if they kind of shucked it's like shucking corn, right? Getting rid of the, the fibrous stuff and then eating what's inside. It's kind of what it looked like. So I don't know if the cattail clippings, if that's some kind of a cache for later or if that's just the leftovers that they didn't want. But I saw something similar in one other place. Um, these are, this is bulrush and they have seemingly done the same thing. So I don't know, there's, there's definitely more questions than answers when it comes to beavers. All right, so I'm going to change gears now into the third segment here of the talk and talk about um, sort of the history of beavers in this area. I think most people are probably aware that historic fur trapping nearly extirpated or got rid of beavers throughout North America. They started out east. They got out here in the early 1800s and went to work in earnest. So about 1811-ish, give or take. And for the next 40 years, the trappers did a number. And, and by about 1850, beavers were functionally gone from this region. That's about the same time, within a couple of years, that large-scale logging was, was getting started. So beavers were removed before we logged, before we replanted from logging, before we started clearing and building roads and building or making, you know, planting farms, making villages, towns, all the infrastructure that goes into all that, everything that we've done, everything that we've built has been in the absence of this animal that can have a very significant impact on the landscape. And so, in terms of the trajectory of beaver populations in the area, uh, there, were, there were a handful of people that recognized their value 100 years ago, 1920-ish, um, that were the first relocation efforts that were here in Washington. And it, over time, there were relocation efforts in every state for maybe 49 out of, or sorry, 47 out of the 48 um, contiguous. And you know, one of the reasons was because people wanted to be able to trap them, but there were still a few people that recognized their value, which actually really surprises me when, I, when you think about it. But regardless of the reasons, they started relocating them and populations started to come back. But what was happening was trapping continued to happen. So the beaver population starts to, to come back, but we keep tra we start trapping kind of you know commensurate. So um, that was the case until the year 2000. And we had an initiative the voters passed here in the state that banned body gripping traps. And so what that meant was you could still trap. They are considered a, a game species, but it became a lot more difficult and a lot more expensive. And that was happening at about the same time that fur prices were declining. 
so the motivation just wasn't there. So a lot of trapping stopped. Meanwhile, um, the Chinook had recently been listed under the Endangered Species Act here in this area. And so a lot of salmon recovery projects started happening. People start planting a lot of young trees and saplings and stakes and stuff. And so all of a sudden you got fewer beavers being trapped and more beaver food being added to the landscape. And so what's happening now is there are beavers in places that where they haven't been for 200 years and pretty much everything has changed since then, like everything. And part of the reason that so much has changed is because of the huge effect that beavers have on ecosystems. They're, they're considered a keystone species because of that, because of sort of their outweighted um, effect on ecosystems. So there are two, two really big categories of that, I, I think. One is pretty well known, or it's, at least it's becoming more and more well known, um, which is the way that beavers add or maintain when they're present a, complex, a complexity to the stream systems, the geomorphology, if you want to um, use the terminology. So you have a stream and beavers come along and then they add a, you know, a series of dams, a complex, and now you've got water running around the dams, over the dams, they're carving new channels. Maybe the dams get enlarged, so it changes again. And these systems get really complex. And when beavers were removed, dams, dams fell apart. We also did a huge amount of um, removing wood from streams, as many of you probably know. So definitely kind of a perfect storm, but, it, but I think it really hinges on beaver. And so a picture like this, which is really very pretty, probably didn't look like this in the past. Like if you could beam yourself back in time a couple hundred years, it might've looked possibly more like this. So this is a different place, it's a bigger river, but this, these are, this is a scalable concept. Here is a tiny stream, same thing is happening. That's a beaver dam on the left and very high water. And you can see in, in the middle and the right, there's channels that are being formed around it. And so if you magnify that all over the place, you, you can start to get an idea for how different things might've looked historically. Oh, and here's, the, here's another picture of that. This is the same dam a little further down. Um, water's flowing over it because it's super high. And this is a heron snatching up a fish that's crossing. So, so the other, the other that, that's one piece, the, the geomorphology piece. The other piece that I argue that has changed dramatically in the last couple hundred years in the absence of beavers is the vegetation community, the riparian vegetation community. And so like in this photo, which is gorgeous, it's actually not even a single channel um, a single thread channel. There's, it looks like there might be some, um, some, one, you know, um, multiple channels here, which is quite nice. But if you look at the vegetation, these are all mature conifers. And I would argue that again, if you could go back in time, this would have looked pretty different. And so that's something that I've been thinking about lately. So I'll step back here. So this is a uh, a map of current, the current streams and rivers in King County and, and major water bodies. About three or four years ago, a student at UW named Ben Dipbrenner developed something called the Beaver Intrinsic Potential Model. And so what he did was he ignored vegetation because that can be replanted. And he just looked at stream gradient, um, channel width, and valley width to determine where are places that are suitable for, for beaver habitation? Where could they be if there was vegetation and you know, not infrastructure? Um, and so he did that on a scale. Zero was unsuitable. And then one through three were different degrees of suitability. So th these aren't all equal, but just to, to illustrate what this could look like, um, to, to make a point, I turned all of the one to three, one same color so you can see. And that's what this is. So 
conceivably all of that green are places where beavers could have lived in the past. Now, if you're looking at Puget Sound, I, I kind of ran out of time. I would have liked to have made the main part left it blue because of course they're not out in the middle of Puget Sound, but beavers actually do live in saltwater estuaries. So if I, if I would have had a little more time, I would have left a, a line around the margin there and, and left it green. All right. So all of these places where beavers would have lived, they would have been affecting the vegetation, like, like we've kind of already talked about. So rather than have uh, a straight up and down bunch of you know, trees that are straight up and down, rather than have a bunch of conifers, you're probably gonna have a bunch of uh, deciduous plants that are getting chewed and re-sprouting and look, not all of them, but a lot of them are gonna look like this. Another thing to think about is, especially if you happen to be in the restoration world, um, we have so many constraints these days. You know, there's roads and homes and farms and all kinds of places that you don't want water, that you don't want to flood. Historically, those would not have been there. And so in any given place, there would have been ample food. So uh, I, I mentioned that because whenever beavers lived in a place, the odds that they would have affected every single plant are pretty low, right? They, they would have eaten a lot, but they wouldn't have eaten everything. And so you still would have had trees that would have been able to, to become old growth, even in areas with beavers. Um, and then of course, places with steeper slopes and, and um, places that are not habitable at all, the zeros on, on Ben's scale, um, they would have, I'm pretty sure they would have been left alone for the most part. But I think we would have had a much more complex matrix, both spatially, um, uh, sorry, structurally, and in terms of species than we just typically think about these days, just based on what we see around us all the time. So in a place like, um, like I'm basically trying to describe where you might have some trees that get a little bigger, then if a beaver comes along and cuts it down, like in, a, in this kind of a situation, then you're gonna open up the canopy and a lot more light's gonna let, be let in, right? And then it's gonna give younger vegetation an opportunity to grow up, younger being smaller, being their preferred size range. And so all of these things to me say that beavers are or were historically a significant agent of change or disturbance. The, the change agents. And if you, if you kind of, um, if you can think about the fact that they go out and eat, and then a little while later, there's even more food than what, what they ate. Like that, that doesn't happen with people. If I go to my fridge and get a frozen chicken burger or something, and you know, three weeks later, there's not two in its place. So if, if we accept that there would have been a lot more beavers historically, then it makes sense that there would have been a lot more beaver food historically. So the way that beaver dams and ponds work is the, the dam slows down the water and sediment falls out. And so over time, sediment builds up and eventually in a lot of places, if they're left alone long enough for this to happen, um, you get what's called a beaver meadow. The, the, the sediment just builds up so much that there's just no open water left and rushes, rushes will start to grow, sedges will start to grow eventually, you get grasses, eventually, excuse me, you'll get shrubs growing up. And then when the food supply looks good again, boom. A new family will dam a stream, flood the area, and the cycle will begin again. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jan. Um, that was very informative and excellent talk. I think we've got some good questions for you. Um, can you hear me? Uh-huh. Okay, good. I just <laughs> kind of 
weird being out here in cyberspace, but you know. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to go through the questions that have come in and um, you can uh, take a whack at them. So here's the first one. Are any known impacts to the beavers using the lodges next to 520, considering the ongoing construction almost directly adjacent? Yeah, I didn't mention that, but yeah, unfortunately, um, that lodge is right where they need to put a whole bunch of construction equipment. And um, taking off my King County hat for a moment and putting on my Beavers Northwest hat, <laughs> we we tried to get them to reconsider or to figure out if there was any way that they could put the equipment anywhere else. And they said they were actually very responsive and said that. There really wasn't any other way, but they would be happy to, to work with us to make sure that the beavers don't get harmed when they have to move the lodge and stuff or destroy it, basically. Yeah. So here's a good one. How do they carry mud? <laughs> um, they, with their paws in their chest, they just scoop it up and swim through the water. I've, I've read accounts where they'll also walk. So if you can just imagine like this. You ever kind of walking along with a bunch of mud and stuff. Oh, wow. um, and they, I, I, the, when I've seen videos of them kind of walking around or working on their dam or anything like that, they, they look like they move kind of in slow motion. When they swim up and slap mud on that, that's pretty quick. But otherwise, if they're walking, they seem to move so slowly. So that's why it just fascinates me that they can build these huge structures and keep water contained and just do all the things that they do because they always look like they're moving in slow motion. Yeah. Um, this person wants to know if you're aware of the dam at the south end of the North Creek Business Park, just north of Home Depot and Bothell. Uh, I don't know that I am. Okay. Um, and following same person, the family at Juanita really looks like looks like they really like the fragrant water lily leaves. We watch them roll them up like a cannoli yeah. before they eat them. <laughs> they totally do. <laughs> yeah. Do they? <laughs> yeah, they use their front paws and they just like grab the leaves and kind of do like that and yep. <laughs> um, do beavers usually fell trees with the orientation? towards standing water um that's that's fun um i've i've read that some people say that they have that this mystical power but then i've heard other people say well there's usually a slope to the land so it kind of makes sense that it would fall that way uh -huh. um, it does tend to fall that way but i don't know if it's because they are trying or if it's because of just where where they stand in the slope of the the banks and stuff. <laughs> okay. Um, do beavers understand that trees grow over the course of years and that they can't take too much at one time or a tree will die? Do they understand the meaning of sustainability? <laughs> <laughs> I, I would argue they do better than we do, but yeah. Um, <laughs> I, so something that I'm really interested in and I'm hoping to start actually looking at with, with some uh, monitoring is not so much, I mean, this might be slightly different from the question, but in terms of like the, um, the stakes that we plant, if, if you plant them, assuming they grow roots before they get cut, I mean, if they get cut before they grow roots, they're dead, but assuming they grow roots, how many survive? Like what is the percentage? And not only, the short-term percentage, but, but then the long-term survival. So that is, that's something that I'm just picking off. Um, that's not exactly the same question, but it's related because I, I am not seeing the stumps and things that are just dead unless they the, unless they drown because the water also came up and drowned them. But if, if, um, if they're going at one of these plants, Again, the, these are the re-sprouting species. Of course, if it's a non-re-sprouting species, it's going to die. Yeah. But they, they, you know, you can you can do a lot of cutting on a willow, and it's still going to come back. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, they don't, they, they don't like the Douglas fir and the things that don't come back. So right. they, need, they need more food. We need to give them more food in places where we want them. So I, I was wondering if, do they, do you think historically, did they establish lodges and inhabit an area for a certain amount of time? And then when the area was sort of, what you, what you've said is it suggests that they don't exhaust an area, but would no, they, I, would they move? Would they I move? I think they would. Yeah, for sure. And, and so it's, and I was, I could say, I could have said this, there, there have definitely been studies done that have looked at beavers moving back and forth within an area. So they're in one part of their, and, and um, in terms of density, the most dense you usually see, like if, if, if there's an area that's really heavily populated, think of like a half mile. So stream and wetland complex, about a half mile, that, that's where one, that would be like one family's territory and they are very territorial. Um, so within that half mile, they, they've totally been seen to move back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's what they would do nowadays if, if the opportunity was there. I mean, everything is just, it's different and more complicated now because, um, because we're here and they're very adaptable. So it's, there's so many degrees of complexity to all of it, but yes, um, within an area, they would move back and forth. And if they were in an area and they exhausted their food supply because it was just a constrained small area, then they might completely move somewhere else. So absolutely, yeah. Uh, how far from the water's edge do they forage, typically and maximally? Um, they, they prefer close, obviously. I think they've been sort of the outer range that people will say is like, two or 300 feet, that's pretty far. Um, one of the reasons that I think you see dams get built up over time is because at, the, at, a, at a water level that would be otherwise acceptable for making sure that the lodge entrance is submerged, they've, they've eaten stuff close to shore. And so, it, and I don't know if this is 100, if, I don't know if this is true, but this is what it looks like. Um, then they can build up their dam the water is going to spread out more and then they're going to be able to more safely access stuff that would have otherwise been farther away. Because sure. in addition to wanting to have the, the lodge entrance submerged, um, they also, they use, <clears throat> the water is all about safety, not all, but it's a lot of it is about safety from predation. And so if you don't have to walk that distance, if you can swim it instead, you're a little safer and it's less work because you don't have to drag it as far. You can get it in the water and then float it back. Yeah. Um, here's a, I'm new to beavers, have beavers active, have beavers active on the property this year for the first time, and they start working on a big willow tree and then abandon it for another tree, not dropping any waste of their time. <laughs> sure. Oh, to get into the mind of a beaver. They seem to yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and I would, I would say, if it, again, like I said a little while ago, if there is some vegetation that you definitely want to protect, consider fence. Yeah. So I wouldn't fence all of it because, well, I wouldn't fence all of it because I would want them to be able to eat something. If you really, really don't want them around, you could consider fencing all of it. it depend, I mean, it depends on the situation. Um, yeah. one, of, one of my primary roles is to help facilitate coexistence. And this talk was not about the, their benefits, but I could, I could do another hour or two on the, their ecosystem benefits that they bring. And so anytime we are able to figure out how to coexist, how to leave them alone, um, it's, it's gonna be better for the environment, better, better for everybody really. Um, it, those are, it's a whole other topic. Also the coexistence tools, that's a whole other talk. So, there's so much um, that I could talk about and we have such a small amount of time, but people can definitely feel free to get in touch with me later with you know, follow-up questions to these other topics that I didn't go into at all. Yeah, we've, we've got quite a few questions here. I'm not sure that we, we have enough evening left to get to them all, but I'll, <laughs> I'll try. Um, let's see here. What recommendations do you have for local governments living with beavers in a densely populated urban suburban environment? Do you have any that's, resources for using beavers as a tool for surface water maintenance? That's that. Wow. 
Um, that's a great one. That's there's a lot in that question. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I I'll, I'll try to be brief. I've actually been developing um, what I call a planning for beavers manual, and I hope to have it out by April. I'm giving a talk about it in June, so it has to be done by then. But um, the the whole idea of this manual is to help people think proactively when planning projects. Anything that has a, a planting component, anytime you're going to be putting any plants in the ground, especially think about trying to think proactively, like let's assume that beavers are going to show up. So, you know, let's think about what areas could flood. Um, what can we do to make sure that doesn't happen? Um, and then go a step beyond that and think, okay, this is a restoration project for salmon. How can we actually set beavers up for success to help us? How can we, or to help salmon? How can we design this project to position them so that they can do what they do uninterrupted at, and let, you know, we can maybe do a little less engineering and let the beavers do a little bit more engineering. So I think just generally as, as a society, we're just on the early, early brink of thinking like that. But this is, these are the early days. We're really just starting to think like that. Mm -hmm. um, there was a second part to the question. Oh, stormwater, was that it? That might be somebody I know teasing me about stormwater. Um, Do you have any resources for using beavers as a tool for surface water maintenance? Surface water maintenance is a tool for surface water maintenance. They should get in touch with me. Yeah, um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Carter, that's... Uh, <laughs> um, any study of carrying capacity, forage, and territory space of urban landscapes for beaver? Studies in urban areas, I don't... Hmm, probably, and I'm not, my mind is a little hazy at this point. Um, the, 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 there are, are significant challenges, obviously, in an urban environment like this, where you've got, you've got streams flowing between buildings, and then we want to go in and plant trees and stuff around them, and that's beaver candy, and you don't want flooding happening right outside a building, and it's hard and complicated and that's why I also like to talk about the sort of the history and the fact that nothing that we have planned up until like today yesterday um was planned with beavers in mind and so it's yeah it's really I mean it's unfortunate at the grand scale because you can't undo everything that we've done that would, that, that would just be an unthinkable amount of money it's nobody has that kind of money so how can we change things going forward? I think it's, I think it's really challenging and it's really hard. Um, it's part of the reason I have a job is to help try to solve some of these problems. Yeah. Um, here's a, a question from somebody who works as a wildlife control technician. Um, why is re relocation such a complicated task for such an important animal? As a wildlife control technician, I am told to use lethal measures. I would prefer relocation, but the permitting from WDFW is insurmountable. So this is this is not my, I know enough to answer the question, I think, but this is not my expertise. Um, I, I know that WDFW has started what they're calling a pilot project to get people certified to be able to be relocators. Um, before, prior to that, that, that's happening now, but prior to that, the people who were doing relocations were the Tulalips tribe as a sovereign nation, they could do that. And um, it's complicated even without permitting. It's complicated because you don't just go and trap an animal and then take it somewhere and drop it off, right? The, the landowners probably wouldn't appreciate it. Beavers probably wouldn't appreciate it. And that's best case scenario more likely is the, the beavers are dropped somewhere where there's already other beavers or they don't have a, a good way to make a living. Um, so there's, a, there's a, just a lot involved in it. There's a lot of husbandry mm -hmm. and there's also a, a much greater chance of successfully relocating beavers if they are in a, at least a pair, if not with their whole family. So if they need to be removed from somewhere, ideally you remove the entire family and then 
take them to a facility where they can be held for, I think it's a couple of weeks, two or three weeks, and um, take care of them. So you have to have those skills to be able to, to take care of them and keep them alive. And then take them to a place that has landowner approval, that's been vetted, that you know is good habitat, you know there's not already beavers there, and you can take it up a notch and even either build sort of a starter dam so that they have a little bit of backed up water or some other people build little starter lodges to give them just a little shelter. So there, there's a whole lot to it, um, but I, I'm not the person that does that stuff. I'm the person that just refers people to those folks. So. On a sort of a different track, um, are, are they eating the cambium, the xylem, the what? The uh, what is the what is the, the part <laughs> of the bark or yeah, the, the bark it's the, the, the yeah, it's the outer layer, the, the bark. Uh, yeah, and what one of the things that is, I mean, it's kind of cute, really, is when you find these teeny tiny little sticks, and they still have only like eaten it like corn cobs. They just eat all the way around it like that, so, and. Even when it's really tiny, they still won't just like. Nah, 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 nah. Um, <laughs> yeah, actually, I had I had another picture. I had several more. Um, I'll just put this one up. So that, that there's a an example of what they can do to bark. Um, I don't know that that tree is going to survive. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, they've that, girdled. They've girdled it. <laughs> that's they've girdled it. Yeah, they've yeah. totally girdled it. I, it's amazing to me that they've done such a fine and thorough job but yeah that's uh that's one of those kind of trees where the second you see a little beaver tooth mark if, if you want that tree there you need to get busy with your fence yeah <laughs> um what were the purposes and goals of the beaver relocation laws for eastern and western washington that were on your timeline is that Oh, um, so what? What? So I had them on the timeline just to because they're it's relevant to the sort of the history of beaver management in the area, and um, I'd have to go back to to remember all the dates. But um, in the originally when they wrote those laws, it was only legal to uh, relocate in eastern Washington. So you could move beavers around in eastern Washington, and you could actually even move beavers from western to eastern Washington, but you couldn't relocate them in western Washington. And then that changed, I think it was 2017 that that changed. Um, and so it's only been five years that it's even been legal. And it, actually that pilot program I mentioned is about five years, or um, it was supposed to be a five-year program. And I haven't checked lately to see where they are in that and, and what all's going on with that, but it does sound like it might be time to check in and find out if the, if the pilot phase is, you know, ending soon and, and what happens next. Let's see. Um, somebody wanted to know what the relationship, what, what relationship there was between uh, Native peoples and Native cultures to, to beaver. That is such a great question, and it is something that I don't know yet. I, I have a big stack of papers that I want to read, but I have not gotten into them yet. So I really wish I could answer that question, but it's it's a topic I haven't delved into yet. I know they had a relationship, but I, I couldn't right. tell you. Yeah. <laughs> um, what are their predators, just out of curiosity? Yeah, I think I think historically the main predator would have been wolves. Uh -huh. um, here, here it's us were the primary one, but they, it would still be probably just the larger mam mammals, probably coyotes and excuse me, cougars. But even then, they're probably really only going to be successful against really young beavers. Um, mm -hmm. Beavers are pretty docile animals, but they do still have teeth, and if they need to protect themselves you know, a coyote might not appreciate the, those teeth. So um, really these days it's, it's humans that are the primary predator out here. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing lots and lots of comments about the wonderful photos and an excellent presentation. Um, so I just wanted to pass those on. Thanks. Uh, 
I've always had a question about where water and streams go when meadows grow in former beaver wetlands that have been filled with sediment. Um, oh, that, I hadn't ever heard of it put that way. That's interesting to think about it that way. Um, <laughs> Probably subterranean? I, well, so the way that I think about it is from the, from the because the, the, the meadow is sort of the end of that cycle, the beginning of build the dam. So prior to that, you have a stream flowing through. You build the dam and then you start to back up water, the pond, and that's surface water, but it also trickles down in, in to the groundwater and will raise the water table. So having beaver dams present on the landscape means that you have a much, much wetter landscape. Mm -hmm. And that is why beavers are being looked at through the lens of climate change, like, hmm, they store water. We need water. We know we're going to need more water in the future. So let's see about getting more beavers on the landscape, especially in, in places where we're less concerned for, um, you know, have an effect on our farms and infrastructure. So that's, that's, uh, that is a topic that's being looked at. I'm actually, I got a grant from the Department of Ecology to look at just one piece of that, which is the effects of beaver dam analogs. Um, and so a beaver dam analog, it's, it's a human built beaver dam basically. And the idea is that beavers eventually take them over. That's, that's ideal. Uh, huh. And so um, we're looking at potentially, assuming we get landowner permission, building some beaver dam analogs in the upper Green River watershed above Howard Hansen Dam and measuring the amount of water storage, both surface water and groundwater and changes in stream flow. Because if you have a big water store, you can, you'll, you'll have a stream that's flowing year round, potentially in places that where the stream might go dry or really right. low. So that's another uh, climate benefit. So there, the, like I said, there's a lot of hydrology and stuff that I didn't go into at all. Yeah. But basically um, the, the the water, I, I mean, like I said, I hadn't really thought of it that way, but if it all fills up, then slowly you're going to have less water in the, um, in the well, definitely less surface water storage. And I would imagine less over time, you're going to have less groundwater storage until eventually the beaver comes along and kind of starts that whole process over again. Mm -hmm. Is there only one kind of beaver through North America? Yes. Yeah. Um, I did not brush up on my, my um, geologic history of, of beavers, but yes, we only have Castor canadensis, North American beaver, it used to be called the Canada beaver. There is only one other species of extant beavers, which is Castor, I would say fiber, it might be fever. Um, that's in Europe. So we don't have any of them here, but they have some of ours there. Oh. And that goes back to their history of um, trapping and getting really, really low on numbers and then bringing some of ours over there. And now, of course, they would really like for ours to be gone. Yeah. Um, so they only had there. Yeah. Um, I just want to pass this on. Thank you. Great job weaving in the key information on beaver life history, ecology, ecosystem engineers. Um, with recent history, some beautiful photos too. So, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, here's, here I'll put it on a more beautiful photo than the one that's up right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, is that, uh, somebody has been wondering uh, whether research is being done to repopulate beavers in areas where forest fires um, have gone crazy out west. H have you had any connection with these studies and can you comment? Are they? Um, I, again, that's not my expertise. I know that um, Dr. Emily Fairfax down in California is doing research on that, some really great stuff and Alexa Whipple over in the Metau did work on that and one of her colleagues, Joe Weirich. So there is work being done. And mm -hmm. I think there will be more and more over time. 
Um, and you know, one of the things that the, the people in in beaver world like to, to remark on is the fact that you know I was talking about how they store water. There's more water on the landscape when there's more beavers, and water doesn't burn. And so um, something that I've wondered about is could we could we rightfully call a beaver complex a fire break? And I think people are hesitant to to do that, even though when you look at the pictures, it's that's pretty much what it looks like. Because yeah. <laughs> um, I, I don't have that picture. I had it in here, but I took it out because I was trying to stay focused. Um, but there, there's a picture that I think Joe Wheaton took at the Sharp Spire, and I never remember if that's Idaho or Utah, but it's just this stark, scorched landscape except for the middle and right down the middle, it's this green, lush, wet environment and that's the beaver complex. Yeah, interesting, yeah. Um, can you speak to how beavers, beaver habitats affect salmon? Sure, that's a broad question, but yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there are the, the species that we, know here in this area that they, they directly benefit our coho. Coho use their ponds for rearing. So, so that's, that's something that we know for sure. Um, and I think steelhead is pretty similar. We just don't have steelhead left around here. Or if we do, there's not many. So that's unfortunate. But um, Chinook, the, the, uh, the line is less directly connected. <clears throat> Chinook tend to use larger bodies of water like rivers and stuff. Um, of course, I always remind my colleagues that the headwaters are where the beavers are. So they're at the place where the water starts. So of course they're important. But um, one of the other things that Ben did in his, with his PhD work was uh, he looked at changes in water temperature. And so I think a lot of people know that water temperature is a concern. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a bunch of um, places where the water is just it's way too warm. And so one of the reasons that, that a lot of people in salmon recovery world plant trees is to try to create shade to keep the water temperature from getting even higher. And so one of the things that Ben found in his study was that because of the hyperreic effect, which is the ground water, like I was talking about, you know, you've got the pond and the water goes down into the groundwater and it eventually moves downstream and it eventually comes back up in the stream. And what he found was where it comes back up, it was cooler. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people tend to think, oh, you have a big beaver pond, of course it's going to heat the water. And I think that's probably true at the surface, but downstream, the, the downstream effect is actually a cooling effect of like 2.3 degrees Celsius, which is kind of wow. stunning. Yeah. Um, so that's something that I also want to add to my upper green work um, is to, to also look at water temperature when we put in all of our monitoring here. Um, here, I have a couple of biology questions. Uh, what is the lifespan of a beaver and how do they defend their territory? Oh, that's awesome. Um, so lifespan, I mentioned at the very, very beginning, in the wild, usually 12 years, and that, that's a good lifespan. Um, in captivity, I think more than 20, they can live more than 20 years, but it's, you know, it's harder out in the, out in right. the wild. Um, in terms of territory, they, they mark their territory with scent, scent mounds. So they'll put mud, you know, make a big mud pile kind of on the, not just if they don't circle the whole territory with mud piles, but it seems like they pick key places where maybe other beavers are going to come along and come across it. And so the other beaver comes along and smells that and they're like, okay, it's occupied, I'm gonna keep going. And there's been quite a bit of research into this topic actually. And some people have wondered, you know, do they fight? Do they duke it out? Are they vicious? Yeah. It seems like they try not to fight. They, so they, that would be, I'm sure it happens, but it would be fairly unusual. And I, uh, somebody speculated that they do have these Big sharp teeth, and if they fought, somebody would get hurt. So they basically know just to keep moving when they come across a scent mound. They know that the area is occupied. And and related to that, something that I used to kind of wonder when when one dies, you know, say say the male dies and the female wants a new mate, 
I suspect that there is a change in the pheromones that are released mm -hmm. to let a passing beaver know that there's an available spot there. I, I don't know this for a fact, but I, I think that that must be playing a part in what's going on there. It's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, here's a question, another question along those lines. Do males and females have the same skills or do they specialize in any way? I mean, obviously. Oh, that's a fun question. Female. I don't think they specialize. I mean, yeah. she obviously is the only one that can nurse the, the kids, but right, other right, than right. that, um, they're, they all do the work. I think when a, when a baby beaver is first born, they're not very technically savvy. So there, there's, and that's probably why they live for a couple of years with the family is so that they can learn and be able to go and take care of all the building that they need to do once they leave and strike out on their own. I don't think, you know, it seems like you might not be able to do that in one season. So it kind of makes sense that they stick around for a couple of years, uh -huh. but it's, it's a shared workload. The, the newest kits are probably the ones that get, get a pass because everybody else knows that they're just learning. And, but the other, the, um, the other juveniles, so the siblings, older siblings do take part in teaching the young so and how long do the young nurse oh i don't know uh, yeah i don't know it's a good question uh, if i knew i forgot yeah um i'm <laughs> I, every time i look at the chat i see you know i i get through some questions and i see there's 25 more so um, <laughs> some of them are just comments about how much they've enjoyed the talk but <laughs> i'm i'm i guess what i'm leading up to here is that i'm afraid i'm not going to get through anything through everything before we probably need to let you go um, let me i'll but, go back to my there my email address i um i i respond better to email than phone calls yeah. unfortunately so but if yeah. people want to ask more questions or have a conversation about anything either just for fun or because they have specific concerns, um, definitely feel free to get in touch with me. And somebody pointed out that some of this is available on your, some of the reading material is available on your, on the King County website. Right, I should have said that. I think I'm getting tired. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that's that's a short URL, the kingcounty.gov slash beavers. If you go there, it'll redirect you. And then um, we're gonna be changing the website there's a big refresh that's going to be happening. But for now, the the bottom link on the left, it's like Beaver Working Group. That's where I put all the stuff that we write and develop. Um, so there's a life history paper. There's a paper in there on laws and policies and a like a two two pager short version. And um, there's one on coexistence tools. And I'll put the manual in there when I when I get that done. Um, everything that's in there already needs to be updated. It's on my list of things to do. Um, and I have notes and all, you know, my personal versions of all of those things, but, but yeah, there's, there's quite a bit there. And the, um, the life history one, I'm fairly proud of actually, because of the, I just, I tried to originally source everything in there. What I found when I started reading things was people would, it, everybody's seen this too, right? You go to Wikipedia, you see a line and then you drop it in your paper. And so I think there was a lot of that going on where people sometimes just make assumptions. And so I tried to not make assumptions and tried to go all the way back to the original source. And sure. that said, I am sure there are mistakes in there. hundred percent certain. I know there are, um, <laughs> but I tried very hard to, 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 to do that. And I am really fortunate to have a librarian who helped me with a lot of the research and stuff too. And eventually, and I don't even at this point want to talk about it just because I know it's going to take me years, but the next big thing that I want to do is a, an effects and impacts paper. So similar, but all about the, their interactions with all the other species, both plants and fish, salmon and the rest of the fish, amphibians, um, of course, mammals, and of course, birds, that's a huge one, and all the other stuff. Um, so that's bugs, too, string bugs, and other insects. So it's, 
I don't know. I hope to finish that before I retire someday. <laughs> yeah. That sounds like quite a bit to bite off. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> um, let's see. There, somebody wants to know if there's any intel on where to find estuarine beaver activity. <laughs> Contact me and we'll talk. I'm not, I don't want, I don't okay. feel comfortable um, sharing yeah, that widely. Yeah, I, I think that we can share the chat with you um, at the end of this and you oh, can good. see what the questions are and what I have not been able, are probably not going to be able to get to. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, let's see. Some people have provided some references here. Uh, somebody asked if this is going to be available for viewing later. And yes, we the presentation is being recorded and it will be um, go to the WNPS website and look for recordings and you will you will find it. It will probably take uh, a couple of days, maybe a little longer to get it edited and get it put up on the site. Um, let's see, what do you think is the most remarkable and interesting beaver adaptation? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. There's so many, um, you know, I might, I might cop out a little bit and remark on just how adaptable they are in general, if you, you know, if, especially if you've thought about birds, you've probably heard of the winners and the losers and the ones who do well when people come along versus the ones that don't do as well. And beavers are winners. They find a way no matter what. And that maybe that is their best adaptation. Um, they surprise me almost daily with where they can make a living. Um, the, I have a hard time arguing that um, everywhere they decide to live is necessarily helping biodiversity. I think it probably would if you let, get, left them alone and gave them enough time. But if they're, you know, if there's a risk for flooding infrastructure, sometimes you don't get to get to get to that point. Um, for example, if they decide to live in a stormwater pond, right? Um, so that's that's. Uh, that's something I, you know, know, knowing more about how they, they aren't just colonies, not that it should matter, but knowing that this is a family that you're dealing with every time you see a, a group of them. I think that also just sort of affects the way that I see them as individuals. And I think, I, you know, I'm a little embarrassed to say that, but on the other hand, people love orcas for the same reason. I mean, they, they see these bonds between these family members. And um, so even when maybe they're not contributing, um, I still would rather see them live relocated, you know, the tra trapped and, and relocated as opposed to, to le lethally trapped. Um, I just, it's one of the tools in the toolbox. It totally is, but I have a hard time with it just on a, see, I shouldn't even say that with my King County hat on because it is a tool in the tool, toolbox, but it's hard for me. I don't, I don't yeah. like seeing um, lethal trapping. Sure. Um, what is the estimated population density in King County currently and Seattle area in particular? And, you know, <laughs> maybe you can. Nobody knows. Yeah. We don't know. Yeah. Um, I think with Seattle, Ben actually did look at that, and I don't, I don't know the answer, or if he came up with an answer that specific. But um, you know, you could do similar work that he did, but then look at what vegetation is there. So take it a step beyond what's potential and see what's likely, and then make a whole bunch of assumptions and extrapolate and do a bunch of math, and then come up with something that may or may or may not be realistic. Right. But um, but we don't know. We don't know, and. There, there have been people, you know, kind of trying to push for the state to figure out a way to try to um, track populations, especially in areas like eastern Washington, where the numbers are very different than they are here. They're really, really different. And um, they're doing a lot of work over there to 
to try to rehabilitate streams and using beavers to do that. And so for those folks, they, they build beaver dam analogs and couple that with relocation. One of my questions in the upper green here in Western Washington, totally different story, is can we just plant willows and not even um, put, a, put, a, put in BDAs and see if beavers will, will take over? Because if you go back to the, what I was talking about with um, the, the history and how they were removed and then we logged and then we replanted conifers, you go up there now, it's, it's not beaver habitat in terms of there's no food. There's no food. And right. so um, if you walk around, you'll see, oh, there was a beaver here. It ate, you know, a little bit of salmon berry, but there's not enough food for them to really set up shop. And so one of my things that I'm interested in is, um, you know, let's build BDAs, let's build, uh, coupled with planting willows, let's go over here and only plant willows and see what happens. But in Eastern Washington, they need to couple that with, with relocating beavers just mm -hmm. because the source populations are so much lower than they are here. And so when you have such a huge difference in populations, I mean, they should, they should kind of potentially be thought of differently. And, you know, I would, I would not suggest that, I mean, beavers are pretty plentiful here in Western Washington, at least around King County. I should really just talk about what I know. There, there's a lot here in King County because we know that they're in all the major water bodies. They're in all the big rivers and the big lakes. And so there's a, a healthy source population for all the various streams and stuff. Um, so, uh, you know, that it would be ridiculous to try to say that, that they needed protecting in, in, a, in a listed kind of way. Mm -hmm. But in Eastern Washington, I think it's a very different story. And those folks worked so hard over there to, to try to rehabilitate streams and using beavers to help do that. They don't want, a, you know, a trapper to come along and set up a, a, a trap next to what they've been working on. So, um, right. I mean, it's, yeah. Um, yeah. And I know I just keep rambling. I don't even remember what the original question was. But I <laughs> <covered it. laughs> um, I just lost my train of thought a, a, a little bit. But, <laughs> it's um, getting late. <laughs> yeah, I know. I think we should let you go. And uh, I'm sorry to those of you whose questions I didn't get a chance to pass on. Um, I will, I think we can save the chat. And so we'll, we'll share that with you. Um, so okay. you can see what the other questions were. And I guess you're inviting people to reach out to you if, if, if they still have questions they'd like answered. Do you For have sure. any, um, any book or anything that you would recommend if somebody, if, if there were one book or one paper you could recommend the, to somebody who wanted to learn a little more, what would it be? That's hard. Can I pick three? <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> um, a book that really kind of opened my eyes a lot, it's, it's out of print, but you can still find used copies, is called Lily Pond by Hope Ryden, R-Y-D-E-N. And I, I recommend that book. I, I will admit when I started reading it, it kind of, it bothered me the way she wrote. But I gave it another chance, and I was really, really glad I did. I, I, that book, there's a lot in that book. You learn a lot about beers. Um, and then the other two are, are fairly similar. Um, a lot of people may have heard of um, Ben Goldfarb's book, Eager. It's excellent. And there's another book that was written a little before that that, that has, it's different, but it has a lot of the same um, similar to topics is called Once They Were Hats, and that's oh. by Francis Backhouse. So wow. those are those are three three books that you should read. Okay, that's great. Well, all right. Um, I I think we've kept you long enough, and I just want to thank you so much for doing this. And there's lots and lots of um, praise and. Uh, comments on how much people have enjoyed this and and what a good job you've done so that's great i'm, I'm happy thanks for inviting me shelly yeah thank you for doing it all right so let's see here i guess i am going to um hit leave and uh, hopefully i'll run across you in the near future let's go burning all right yeah that sounds great all right okay. good night good night everybody